Thank you so much, uh, Steve. And let's give a big hand to Steve and all the sponsors for this great conference. It's really an honor to be here. All right, so yes, I'm basically here to give good news. Uh, the basic understanding that I'd like to share is that all of us as human beings have been given a wonderful gift. We've been given the gift of a physical body that does not require any animals to suffer to get all the nutrients that we need to be healthy and to thrive and to celebrate our lives on this beautiful planet. So that's the good news. The difficulty is that we've all been born into a culture where from the time we're little infants, we've been compelled to sit down and participate in meals where we're eating the flesh and secretions of terribly abused animals. And this wounds us uh, at a very deep level. So I'm talking basically about the wounding that has happened to us as human beings growing up in a culture that's organized at its core around herding animals and how we can heal ourselves and our society. And one of the main points I want to be making here uh, today is how the, everything we've been talking about, I, I've been here now for uh, just, um, I got here yesterday evening, about GMOs, about the war machine, all these different things, how it has its roots, all of these things have their roots in animal agriculture. It's very important for us to make these connections because if we don't, uh, we'll be never getting to the root of the problems that we're having. If we don't get to the root of them, it's like uh, Henry David Thoreau said, there's thousands hacking at the branches of evil for everyone who's striking at the root. How many of you, just so I have a feeling, um, have read the World Peace Diet? Anybody? Yeah, a few of you. I see a few hands waving. That's good. All right. So I'd like to um, talk a little bit about health. And the basic idea, as we can see here, we have physical health, which is what most of us are thinking about, our, the health of our physical bodies. And that's what this, when we talk about the real truth about health, we're talking about the health of our physical bodies, but I don't want to just stop there. I want to include also environmental health, and I don't want to stop there. I want to also include cultural health, because these, these are the three uh, outer dimensions of health that are all interconnected. We cannot have a healthy physical body in, if the food is genetically engineered and polluted and there's toxic water and air, and soil, and so forth. We all are aware of that. It's also important for us to live in a society that is healthy, that has basically has justice and freedom, and so forth. So it's very important to understand how these are interconnected. When we eat food that is toxic, uh, we take drugs uh, to uh, treat the diseases that we get, like diabetes, and so forth, and then we urinate those drugs back into the ecosystem, they come back into us again. So there's all these feedbacks that are connected in countless ways between these three outer dimensions of health. But in order to be healthy, we also have to have psychological health and, uh, and spiritual or ethical and or ethical health. And the thing to really understand, the key is that these are all interconnected. On every, every one is interconnected with every other one. So we, I think it's really important for us to get beyond the rather short-sighted view that we only care about our own physical health, the health of our physical body. Uh, the thing to understand, what I've discovered over the last 40, I've been a vegan for 40 years, actually, and, and uh, it's really great to be able to say that because I was always 38 or 39, so I was 40, <laughs> 40 years. I went vegan in, in uh, 1980, and I always say the smartest thing I ever did besides marrying my wonderful wife, Madeline, was going vegan because it really creates a foundation for health on, every, on all five of these levels for all of us. Each one of us and it really is a, is a radiating center of influence. Each one of us is a conscious, aware individual, a being who can make our own choices. And if we're not awake, if we've been harmed and wounded, and we've had our basic wisdom shut down by eating animal foods since we were born, it's very difficult to make the connections that will allow us to create a political system, an economic system, religious educational systems, uh, that are healthy. That otherwise, we're, we're essentially creating systems that enslave us because the underlying behavior of our society, the core fundamental behavior of our society is imprisoning and killing billions of animals, literally, every day, if we include marine animals. So this is a massive, massive system of destruction of life. And it harms all of us at a very deep level, much more than we're aware. So the basic idea is that animal agriculture destroys and harms and erodes all five dimensions of health. 
And it's very important to get this really clearly understood. It's kind of like uh, the Trojan horse. I used to teach college courses in the ancient uh, texts. And the, um, the battle that they had, the, the Trojans uh, with the Greeks, they brought this horse in that had only one, was only going to do one thing, which was, was to destroy them. But they didn't realize that. They thought it was something good. And it's the same thing with animal agriculture. We're taught, we're raised in a society, I know I was, from the time I was a little kid, that meat, dairy products, and eggs give us protein, give us calcium, we need to eat them to be healthy. And so one of the most important things in this whole thing to understand is that everyone, when we leave this conference and we go out into the world and we see people, everyone uh, who is eating animal foods only does it for one reason. Do you know what that reason is? The one reason people eat animal foods? Anyone have any idea? Tastes good. <laughs> Habit, right. It's, go deeper. The, re, the only reason people eat animal foods, the basic fundamental reason anyone eats animal foods is this. We eat animal foods because we're following orders. That's the reason. The only reason anyone eats animal foods is because they've been, they're following orders that are injected into us from the time we're little infants by very well-meaning, loving people. Like in my own case, uh, I remember I was born and raised in Concord, Massachusetts back in the 1950s. And uh, I, I, I was raised in a family. We ate lots of meat, dairy products, and eggs. My mother wanted to make sure we grew up to be strong and healthy, so that's what we ate. And I remember uh, getting a lot of the usual problems that kids have, runny noses, sore throats, earaches, I had an appendicitis. I understand now these things are all directly caused by da primarily dairy, dairy and meat. But the, um, the underlying thing to realize is that I was eating those foods because I was born into it. If we go to any grocery store, just go to the baby food section and look at the little jars uh, of food, you'll see uh, exactly, you'll see meat and you'll see beef and cheese and chicken and, ch and all these foods. So as little kids, we're eating these foods and we don't know what we're eating. I didn't know what I was eating when my mother said we're having bacon. I was the first one there at the table because my mother said we're having bacon. I knew I loved bacon because it was all that fat, all that salt, yum, yum, yum. It was really good. But if I had known what it was, if my mother had told me, like in the Taoist tradition, we're taught to call things by their true names. But we don't do that. We don't call things by their true names. We just call them by other names. And so we're eating bacon. I was eating it. And uh, if she had told me that I was eating the flesh of an animal who had been confined her entire life in a small cage, banging her head against the bars, and then was dragged out and was uh, screaming as they cut her throat and so forth, I would have thought, no, 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 I don't even want to hear about that. You want me to eat that? Uh, can I have some oatmeal and a banana? Maybe something else? But see, we don't know what it is. So I remember when I was about seven years old, um, I asked my mother, uh, like, you know, what we're eating, is this what everybody eats? And my mother said, yeah, this is pretty much what everybody eats. And then she left. And then she came back and said, I'm sorry, you know, that's not totally true. There are vegetarians. And I had never heard that word in my life. And I was at the age when I liked learning new words, especially if they were kind of long and kind of interesting, like vegetarian. So I, I was excited. I said, what's a vegetarian? And she thought for a minute. And then she said, mm, you know, I wouldn't worry about it. You're never going to meet one. <laughs> and, and then she said, you know, I don't, I don't know where they get their protein. So in my young mind, I thought, wow, these vegetarians are extremely rare. My mother, who's so old, she never even met one. And, and not only that, they don't get enough protein. So I had this image of these poor people, these unfortunate people who were dragging themselves through the dirt, begging for protein, who had no energy and were weak and so forth. And so I was just so glad I wasn't a vegetarian. And my mother was totally right. I never heard the word again. That was the end of it. And uh, I remember going away to uh, a summer camp in Vermont when I was in my um, early teens, 13, 14 years old in that time for a few years. And it was one of those beautiful uh, little farms where nothing bad ever happens. Right? A little nestled in the green mountains of Vermont, a few animals, a few chickens and, and other animals. But I remember learning how to catch my own chicken, how to hold her down on this board with two nails in it, I had my axe that I made myself, and I uh, cut her head off, and we put them through the scalding tank. So I learned as a 13-year-old kid uh, how to, how to uh, kill chickens, 
and so forth. And I didn't really have any problem with it because at that point, I had gone through the most intense indoctrination a human being can possibly go through. 13 years, every day for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I was eating not just the food, right, meat, dairy products, and eggs with every meal, basically, but I was eating the narrative. I was eating the story of, of why we have to do this. There's a whole story that we have about that that rationalizes it and makes it okay and, and propels us into this behavior. So it's very important to understand this. Anthropologists understand this. This is one of the basic things. They understand that every culture, every society transmits its values from generation to generation. And how do they do it? They do it through rituals. Every culture has rituals. The primary ritual in every society is basically is meals. So when we're sitting down and eating food, we're not just eating food. We're eating a whole constellation of narratives and stories and attitudes that justify and, and explain our relationship with each other, uh, with our uh, society, with animals, with nature, with the divine, and so forth. And so the narrative of animal agriculture, think about it, what is it? It's a narrative of domination, exploitation, and oppression of other beings. It's a narrative of seeing other beings as instruments to be used. And we're not just we're not just taught, taught about this, we're eating it. It becomes the very cells of our body. So how can we ever think, how can we ever presume to create a culture of peace and justice and freedom and liberation and sustainability when the fundamental ritual in our society that we're all partaking of and eating is the exact opposite of all of those things. It's a, it's a ritual of, of destruction and of, of killing and of sexual abuse and of stealing and of having no respect for other beings, essentially. And so this is the, the, the fundamental transgression in our society that is invisible. This is the place where people who are environmental activists, who are activists for social justice, for GMOs, for all these different things, but they still want to eat animal foods. You cannot have it both ways. If we were eating animal foods in any way, if we're eating animal foods, we're caught, we are the problem because animal agriculture is the fundamental template uh, at the deep level of our consciousness and our society. So this is the thing that we have to really, I think, recall at this time to understand. And so for in, my, in my world, when I was a kid and I was killing that chicken, I knew I was doing a good thing. I thought I'm really doing what Jesus wants me to do, what God wants me to do. I'm a man now, it's kind of a coming of age thing. I can kill my own chicken, and, um, and, I, and I'm a man now. And so the thing to understand is that underlying that was the story. I knew uh, from all these years of eating animal foods that God gave us these animals to eat. They don't have a soul. They taste good. If you don't eat them, you're definitely going to die within 24 hours of a protein deficiency, right? That's it. See, the whole point here is we don't have to blame anyone. This is a systemic we're all, it's a wound. It's, it, we're all wounded by this, all of us. Our basic intelligence is just shut down. Our emotional intelligence, our sensitivity, our awareness, by eating animal foods, it shuts it down. And I remember a little bit later in the summer when um, we all gathered around um, a dairy cow. And again, it was the same thing. You know, on any dairy, organic or not, it's always the same story. I own you, I own your... Uh, baby that's born, I'm going to kill your baby, I'm going to impregnate you again on the rape rack, I'm going to steal your baby, kill your baby. So this is the thing. And so we gathered around this dairy cow. She was only maybe four years old, four, five years old at the most is when they're all killed. Uh, again, on any dairy, organic or not, a small backyard operation or a big uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> commercial operation, uh, the animals are all killed at a relatively young age. And so we, I participated in that. I remember we were standing, and we had a gun, and we put it right to the head of the cow, and we pulled the trigger, and after three tries, she finally crashed to the floor of the barn. And it was, a, and I won't go into it, but it was really uh, shocking to see a 2,000-pound animal reduced to you know, huge amounts of feces and urine and blood. And... Um, and to see that happening, I remember the following year, it was kind of interesting because the following year uh, we did it again. Because we, we, you have to kill these, these cows. You can't, you can't keep feeding them if they're not giving milk. 
They're, the whole idea is they're just here, they're just here for us to use. If you, what the guy said was, he said, if we can't get milk money from her, then we'll get meat money, right? That's it. It's, they're just objects to be used. And so that harms not just them, it harms us. It forces us to reduce our fundamental uh, wisdom and, and compassion and empathy and awareness on such a deep level as a society that um, we just create, of course we're gonna create toxins and war and injustice with each other. How could we not? I mean, there's no way we couldn't, and we have to, because this is, what we're, this is the most fundamental connection that we have with nature and with each other is our food. So, um, so I remember the following year, we didn't want to do it in the barn, so um, the, uh, the guy who, the, who ran the dairy said, well, let's take her up to this little grassy area and do it over there and it won't make such a mess. And so it was so interesting, we had like 30 or 40 kids on a rope trying to pull this cow, and we couldn't. She, you know, these animals are aware of what's going on, and she didn't want to be whatever we were gonna do. She didn't want to have anything to do with it. So remember, we couldn't pull her. So we just did what we always do. We just uh, overwhelmed her with superior force, and we got a chain, and we tied it to the back of a four-wheel drive pickup truck, and we just started pulling, and of course, she couldn't resist that, so she got pulled up there. And I was run, riding in the back of the truck, and I remember when we got almost up there, she broke the chain, it snapped, and the truck lurched forward, everybody fell down, and I remember looking back and seeing this cow with this chain hanging off her neck. She wasn't saying anything, obviously, but she was speaking very loudly and very clearly saying, please, don't do this. And, but I knew there's no option. I mean, these animals are going to be killed. They're going to be sexually abused. They're going to have their babies stolen. And, and that's just, that's it. I mean, we are the ones in power. They have no power. So for me, again, my wound was I was born into a society organized around animal agriculture, and I participated in it by eating it and, and so forth. Luckily for me, uh, right after college, uh, it was during the Vietnam War era, and um, I started questioning the war machine, and I started reading uh, books on Eastern religion and meditating and doing yoga, all this stuff back in the early 1970s in Maine, of all places. <laughs> and um, right after college, my brother and I decided we would go on the spiritual pilgrimage. We thought, we want to find out more about what life is all about. We thought we'd go... Um, you know, the question was like, well, then what do you do? You know, what do we, how, do you, how do you attain cosmic consciousness? That's what we wanted to do. And uh, we, we thought about it for a while, and then we came upon, we knew what would actually work. We knew one thing would work. If we wanted to get conscious, cosmic consciousness, the way to do that was to go to California. <laughs> so we thought, we'll walk to California. So we started walking. I remember walking down the driveway of my parents' home with a little backpack, uh, with some fresh baked cookies, you know, and we were headed out, you know, to California. We got as far as Buffalo. <laughs> After about a month of walking, we walked all the way to Buffalo. I was like, that took, that took quite a bit of doing. But when we got to Buffalo, it was October. It was freezing already. So I thought, well, I have a bachelor's degree from a pretty good school. I can figure it out. We better head south. So we actually walked from there down across upstate New York into Pennsylvania, across Pennsylvania to West Virginia, through West Virginia to Kentucky, and then into Tennessee. And then finally to Alabama. We ended up in a Zen center in Alabama, if you can believe it. But um, on the way, we stopped for a while in a community called uh, The Farm. It was in uh, south of Nashville in Summertown, Tennessee. And The Farm, at that point, in 1975, was the largest hippie commune in the world. It was mostly people from California. They'd come out there, and they had created this, this big hippie commune. About 900 people were there when we got there. And they were all vegetarians. All 900. In fact, we today would have uh, would call, we would have called them vegans. They would have called themselves vegans, but no one knew the word vegan in 1975, so you couldn't even use it. But basically, they didn't eat any meat or dairy products or eggs, and they did it for ethical reasons. And so there they were, and no one was dragging themselves through the mud, begging us for protein. You know, they were actually doing great. They had about 200 children that were all vegan from birth, and they were all thriving. And so I looked at these people, and they were really very inspiring to me because they were living close to the earth. They had a, a pretty organized spiritual life in the sense that they were committed to helping to create a better world by growing food that was healthy and organic and, and, and giving birth to their own kids and uh, a lot of really beautiful things. So um, I said, why are you guys vegetarians? You know, how does that all fit? And the guy I was talking to, he said, well, there's two reasons primarily. Number one, most of the food we're growing, we're feeding to, um, to imprisoned animals while people are starving. 
So it's well understood that food shortages uh, are unnecessary. Uh, we could, we're feeding enough food. I mean, I know today, right, right now, we're growing enough food to feed at least 12 billion people. Very conservatively, you have about 7.5 billion people. How, can, how is it possible, if we're growing enough food to feed 12 billion people, we only have 7.5 billion, that we have almost a billion of our brothers and sisters chronically hungry and starving? It's very easy. With most of the food we're growing, we're feeding to imprisoned cows, pigs, chickens, uh, factory farm fishes, eat huge amounts of grain also. And so... Uh, what they were telling me was that the food shortages are uh, unnecessary and they're the primary driving cause behind global conflict. So they say we're eating lower on the food chain so there's enough for everyone to eat so we can have peace in the world because we can never have peace without justice. We have to really understand that. You know, it's, and there's a fundamental injustice. Anyone who's eating any animal foods, any meat, dairy products, or eggs is directly harming uh, other living beings. Like Thich Nhat Hanh says, anyone who eats meat is eating the flesh of starving children. Because essentially, these, these kids are, get, are, you know, families are forced off their land in order to grow uh, genetically engineered corn and soy in countries all over the world that is then uh, you know, made into meat and dairy products that are shipped to, uh, to, the, to the wealthy to eat. So when you have a situation where the rich people are taking most of the land, most of the water, most of the petroleum, uh, and, and creating most of the pollution and, and eating basically high off the hog while people, other people not far away are literally starving. The, the mothers have their kids starving in their arms and it's completely unnecessary. Animal agriculture is the most violent form of, of living towards animals, towards ecosystems, towards other human beings you could possibly imagine. So I got a little glimpse of that from these people just explaining to me that we could feed everyone if people would eat a plant-based diet easily. We could, that's the good news. We, this earth, how many of you have noticed by now that the earth is beautiful? Anybody? No, <laughs> the earth is so beautiful. And, not, and this beauty, I think just seeing the beauty, I'm so fortunate since the World Peace Diet has been translated now into all these languages, I've been giving lectures on this topic in over 50 countries. We've been all over Africa, Asia, uh, Eastern, Western Europe, North and South America. And there's so much beauty in, in forests and rivers and oceans and I think when we see that beauty of the animals and of ecosystems, it awakens something in us, hopefully, to protect this beautiful planet for, for the animals and for ourselves and for our children. But not only is the earth beautiful, the earth is abundant. The earth is amazingly abundant. It's like Gandhi said, there's enough for everyone's need. There'll never be enough for everyone's greed. And the problem is animal agriculture is fundamentally the epitome of greed. It's the epitome of wastefulness, of destructiveness, of, of, uh, of unnecessary violence towards other beings. And when we, when we engage in animal agriculture and we're cutting down rainforest, I used to you know, yell, really, <laughs> for, for years about how, how we're cutting down an acre of rainforest every second to grow genetically engineered soybeans to feed, again, imprisoned cows, pigs, chickens, and, and fishes. Uh, and that's mostly going to, uh, to the wealthy, uh, more, the more industrialized nations that can afford that. But it's uh, devastating to see that this, uh, this one acre per second is now up to, under the current administration in Brazil, it's up to about four acres per second are, are being cut and burned. And when we cut down rainforests, we're not just cutting down some trees, we're destroying ancient wisdom. And we're, we're destroying whole webs of life that include not just trees, but countless beings, insects and birds and other animals and, and plants and destroying the fundamental uh, genetic wisdom and information on our planet for, for burgers, for animal foods. And it's completely unnecessary. We can feed everyone on this planet on a fraction of the land if we would eat animal-based foods. Most of the GMO grains that are grown are, are feedstock for animals, right? Corn, soy, uh, canola and cottonseed, these are all primarily animal feed. And alfalfa, these are pr primarily animal feeds. So anyone who's eating animal foods is eating most of the GMOs, 90% of the GMOs are for animal feed. We have to really understand that clearly. But this whole violence towards, um, towards animals and towards hungry people is part of animal agriculture. So that was one thing they mentioned. The other thing they, the guy said was, he said, do you know what the animals go through? And I remember saying, um, don't tell me. I don't, want to, I don't want to hear about it. But he just told me a few things, which I think you know, we should all be aware of, that these animals who are being killed and eaten, whether it's 
A small backyard operation or a large commercial operation, it's the same thing. It's hideous violence, it's mutilation of these animals, confinement of these animals, ownership of another being in itself is violence, to say, I own you. That is, that is only slaves would do that. Only slaves would own another being. Free people would never do that. And we have to really understand very clearly what this is. Anyone who's eating animal foods is being exploited. If we exploit animals, we're being exploited. It's not in our best interest to do it. We're in the prison if we're eating animal foods, whether they're organic or not. It doesn't really matter because organic animal foods are still enormously violent. And this is something that I, most people don't realize. I didn't realize it myself, but since traveling around all over the world, I've been able to go to animal sanctuaries um, in like all over North America, Canada, uh, and uh, Australia, New Zealand, and Asia, and Africa, so many different places. And the people that have sanctuaries for farmed animals, if far, these are cows and pigs and chickens and turkeys, other animals that have somehow escaped uh, the system of animal uh, agriculture, um, they, they, they say the same thing over and over again. They say animals that come to their sanctuaries come from both little backyard operations and come from big commercial factory farms. And they say the same thing. They say the animals that come from little backyard operations are very often as severely abused or more severely abused than the animals that come from factory farms. So don't ever think, we should never think that somehow there was some good old days when they had small farms where animals were treated well. They've always been abused and impregnated against their will and their babies have been stolen, they've been killed. And there's no way to do that without without abuse and violence, and uh, it's unnecessary. I mean, especially today, it's completely unnecessary. We can feed everyone, as I say, veganic agriculture is now understood, organic and also totally plant-based agriculture without using any bone meal or blood meal or manure. We don't need animal inputs. We can use crop rotation, we can use cover crops, we can use compost and so forth. And this plant-based agriculture is actually as uh, efficient or even more efficient than using animals. Because as soon as we use animals, it's inefficient. We're, feeding, we're putting it through the, the animals and we don't have to do that. So the good news is there's nothing stopping us from creating a world of peace and freedom and justice and equality except for the outer practice of animal agriculture, which according to what I'm saying here, this is devastating our health on all levels, environmental health, our cultural health, our physical health, our psychological health, uh, and our spiritual health. But we look at the outer levels, uh, it's very important to understand. I'm, I've gone into it a little bit. I'm going to say just a couple more things about the outer level. The environmental health, we've, we've heard quite a bit about it, but just to realize how inefficient it is, according, for example, to the National Academy of Sciences, which did a review of the literature, essentially, on, a, on an amount of land, you can feed 12 people uh, a plant-based meal, food, or one person eating the standard Western diet. So it's about 12 to 1. I mean, think of that. That's not just 2 to 1 or 3 to 1. It's about 12 to 1 in terms of land use and how much, many calories you can get out of the land. With the terms of water, it's even more. According to the United Nations, it's 30 to one. But even, you know, these are, this is amazing. And petroleum, it's about 12 to one. Pollution, it's about 12 to one. So when we move to a plant-based way of eating, we are radically reducing our environmental footprint. It's really important to understand that very clearly, that according to biologists, someone who moves to a plant-based diet is saving at least about a, between 100 and 150 trees every year where the oceans are being completely strip mined of fish because uh, we're not just feeding fish to people directly. Scientists have discovered that if you feed fish to cows and pigs and chickens, uh, it, it, they give more milk and they fatten up. So this massive destruction of the oceans, the complete overfishing of the oceans, where uh, oceanographers are telling us that by the year 2040, there won't be any fish left, basically. There'll be just nothing but jellyfish. We're, complete, we're attacking ruthlessly the oceans and the rainforest and the climate and soil and aquifers are all being drained and destroyed to, to eat animal foods. And yet, the media doesn't talk about it. I understand exactly why the media doesn't talk about it. I was born and raised in a newspaper family. I grew up, my father owned a whole chain of newspapers right outside Boston. And I learned growing up sitting around the table that you don't run any news articles that the advertisers will find objectionable. 
They'll stop advertising. They'll advertise in the other paper that doesn't do that, and you'll go out of business. So we have to really understand clearly that as soon as we're involved in any kind of media, radio, television, newspapers, it's nothing but lies, basically. I mean, it's whatever the, whatever the advertisers want you to think is what's in there. And so the biggest advertisers, the big pharmaceutical industries, the agrochemical industries, the banks, the petroleum industries, they all thrive on animal agriculture. They, that's where they make their money. And so we're not, that's why this is such a precious conference. The Real Truth About Health conference is not, it doesn't depend on these advertisers. So we can actually get a little bit of, as Gandhi said, satya, you know, truth. We can get some truth. Satyagraha is truth power. So it's very important to understand that environmental devastation of all kinds, there's so many different types of environmental devastation, the, the drugs that are going into the water from people getting so sick. I mean, to really understand this, that people uh, in, in less industrialized nations who are having hunger and starvation, that's, animal agriculture is violence towards them because they're going hungry and it's unnecessary. They're being forced off their land and uh, their land is being used to, to make meat and dairy products for the rich. So the whole thing to understand is that animal agriculture uh, destroys uh, societies, essentially. It creates hunger where there doesn't have to be hunger. And war, uh, where there doesn't have to be war, because war is driven in many ways by hunger. And also, we talked yesterday a little bit about workers. I mean, the, the workers who work in animal agriculture, uh, the, the, and the dairies, and, and other, uh, I've been to these places, I've been to dairies, and to uh, slaughterhouses, and slaughter plants, and to stockyards, and factory farms. And these workers have the, the highest rates of injuries, basically, among all workers. They have among the highest rates of suicide, drug addiction, alcohol abuse, spousal abuse. They, they're doing the work that brings out the worst in them. If you have to go to work and stab animals all day or impregnate them on a rape rack all day, I mean, how do you go home to your family? If I take out my wallet, and this is the thing to really have to understand very clearly, is that this is the voting booth. This is, these votes really get counted, these dollars. You know, the other votes, I don't know, I, I have my doubts, <laughs> but these votes get counted. So if I'm voting for meat, dairy products, and eggs, that goes into a system, it gets counted, and because of that, because of my demand, somewhere, someone's going to stab an animal, someone's going to impregnate a female against her will on a rape rack, someone's going to steal the baby and kill the baby. That's directly what's happening, that's what I'm causing. The thing we have to understand is, very clearly, that's not where it ends. I vote for it, I cause it, and that's, that's enough right there. But then I turn around and I actually eat it. I eat the violence, the terror, the fear, the despair, the anxiety that these animals are experiencing. And I feed it to my innocent children. So they teach their children to do the same thing. So we have these animals in our hands who yearn just like we yearn for the opportunity to live their lives and to celebrate their lives on this beautiful planet and we crush them. We torture and mutilate and kill and rape them. How can we expect that we are then qualified to have healthy food, a very uh, you know, healthy government, kind and loving and wise leaders? It's, we, this is a grassroots movement. We have to wake up. We have to realize that we are being enslaved when we enslave animals. We are being exploited when we exploit animals. That our actions to try to liberate uh, people and ourselves are merely ironic if we don't stop eating animal foods. We want for ourselves what we refuse to give to others. You know, I used to teach college courses in comparative religion. Every religion understands that the fundamental essential essence, really, of all the world's religions, it's beautiful, it, it agrees. It's basically this teaching. Whatever you most want for yourself, give that to others. And that basic teaching, if we want to be loved, then be loving. If we want to live in a clean, healthy environment, then help others live in clean, healthy environments. If we want to be free, then let others be free. Animals how many of you have a uh, companion animal or at some point have had a companion animal, a dog or a cat? Yeah, some of you. So you know what I'm talking about. You know that that dog or cat, there's a, there's a being in there. If you look in her eyes, there's someone in there. And her interests are to her as important to her as my interests are to me. 
And this is, this is the true, just as true for cows and pigs and chickens and fishes, right? There's a being in there looking out and their, their freedom and their ability to live their lives. And so we would be very upset if someone came along and took our cat and put her into a, a closet and made her live in her own excrement and they were going to eat her. We wouldn't let that happen. We would do anything we could because we know her. We care about her. What animal agriculture is, it destroys our capacity to care. We don't care. We learn the subtext of every meal is don't care. The cremation of care, essentially, the destruction of care in our society. So what we're talking about when we say vegan or when we say uh, animal liberation, essentially, it's just to awaken our caring again, and the caring that's in our heart naturally. So it's really important to understand uh, the interconnectedness of these different types of health and that animal agriculture is the most destructive thing we're doing to the health of the planet. There's nothing that comes close to animal agriculture, nothing. Animal agriculture reaches its tentacles to the bottoms of every ocean, into everywhere you, in the heart of the rainforest, into every, uh, every building in our society, into every cell in our bodies if we're eating these foods. And everything it touches, it's harming and destroying Animal agriculture is demonic. We have to understand this so clearly. It's, it's, it brings out the worst in us. And if, we, if you were all born as cows or pigs or chickens, I would not have to explain this to you. You would understand this very well. <laughs> this is, since we're born as a superior dominant species, it's not so obvious. We've all been brainwashed in an incredibly deep level because we're eating this, this uh, teaching. So to understand environmental health, cultural health, physical health, and the irony is when some people are starving, other people are eating huge amounts of grain processed through animals and getting liver disease, kidney disease, heart disease, strokes, um, diverticulitis, uh, Alzheimer's disease, breast, prostate, and colon cancer, uh, the dementia. All these diseases have been definitively linked to eating diets high in animal-based foods. I think this is pretty well known. I won't go into it here. I mean, every, this is gonna be repeated uh, by many of the other teach, uh, teachers here, but this is well documented. You know, I, like I say, here I am 40 years uh, as a vegan, and uh, it's so liberating. You know, I haven't had to go to a, a, a doctor. I haven't been to a doctor in 45 years. You know, I haven't been to a, a, a drugstore. You know, I mean, the, the basic idea is that we, when we're living our lives and we're connecting with our purpose and we're connecting with something beyond material reality, connecting with the, the fundamental truth that what each one of us is, is a field of infinite and eternal consciousness. That we're here on this earth for a few years functioning through a physical vehicle. And we're not here to dominate and exploit and compete with other beings and use them as instruments. That's animal agriculture programming us through that so we're enslaved. We have to realize our true nature, the true nature of human beings and of all living beings, is infinite and eternal consciousness that is founded on the wellspring of love and joy and freedom and creativity. That's our true nature. And so animal agriculture shuts all that down and we end up in a body that gets uh, very weak and sick and uh, in ways that really are unnecessary. And our children, especially eating these foods that are based on animal agriculture, uh, you know, bear, they're, they're bearing the, the, the real uh, weight of this. But it's important to go into the spiritual and psychological dimension of this too, uh, just to mention it very briefly, to understand that uh, animal agriculture, when we're eating animal-based foods, we're eating a whole uh, set of attitudes. And I'll go into those attitudes a little bit later. I think right now I'll just say the attitudes are not in our best interest. The main one, I'll just mention the main one, the number one attitude is an attitude of disconnectedness. The fundamental message of every meal, if we're eating meat, dairy products, and eggs, is don't make the connection. That's the basic teaching. We're eating bacon. I'm eating a burger. I am eating a fish stick. We don't think of the being. We're, we're taught, we stop short. We don't go and think about what it took to get that on our plate. We don't want to look deeply to see what is required to bring that onto our plate, what the animal had to go through, what the workers had to go through, the destruction of the climate and the environment and everything that had to happen so we, that can be on our plate. So, a, so if we have that as the fundamental ritual in our society, which are meals, everyone is teaching us three times a day don't make the connection, what is that doing to us as, a, as individuals and as a society? You know, my PhD from Berkeley is in education. 
Intelligence is the capacity to make relevant connections. Intelligence is the ability to make connections. So if every meal essentially is a ritual where we learn at a very deep level to not make the connection, don't make the connection, then it's a direct attack on our intelligence, culturally. It's where every meal is teaching us, don't look deeply, don't feel deeply, don't care deeply, don't listen deeply, just stay shallow and don't make the connections and trust authority. Disbelieve whatever they say. And, and this is, so this is, eating animal foods is the perfect way to create a society where people are easily controllable where they won't question the official narratives and the official stories, where they're basically in, completely disempowered to do anything to protect themselves. Because eating animal foods shuts down our intelligence, not only our cognitive intelligence, but also our emotional intelligence. We lose our capacity to care. We lose our sensitivity. And besides that, it infantilizes us. It makes us all into infants. What are we doing drinking the memory secretions of animals when we're adults? Why are, we, why, do we, why are we drinking milk from a cow, for goodness sakes? I mean, we're not little calves. You know, this is something that is so uh, perverse that it's hard to even imagine. I mean, there's this great um, uh, image by Michael Clapper. He says, if anyone wants to know if you are a person who really needs to eat um, dairy products and milk, drink you know, milk, then there's a good way to find out. Go home after the lecture's over, when you have a chance, whenever you go home next, and go into the bathroom and turn the light on and look in the mirror. And if you see a little calf, then you're designed to eat cow's milk. <laughs> if you don't see a little calf, then like, what are you doing? <laughs> I mean, it's the greatest thing if you want to just give up the primary driving force behind most of the diseases that are filling up the hospitals, dairy is it, for sure. I mean, it's, it's, there's so many levels. I can talk I can, for hours on dairy, but I won't. But anyway, so these, these are the, um, the psychological, some of the stories, some of the narratives that we're eating, the attitudes that are harming our intelligence, harming our capacities, and really disconnecting us from our spiritual wisdom. I think that's the thing to understand. So um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the history of our society because this is something that most people don't understand. So the core of our society is herderism. This is a word I coined. Herderism is a society which we are that's based at its core around herding animals. We are, most people don't realize this, that we're a herding society, that we're organized around herding animals for food. We don't walk around, most of us, po with a stick poking sheep but it's, it's done on a massive scale. Like I say, uh, if we don't include fish, we're talking about 70 uh, billion animals, or just the land animals are imprisoned uh, in, in basically mechanized herding operations for the most part uh, around the world. And, and then literally, uh, I mean, two thirds of the fish we're eating now are factory farmed, right? So they, these are, we're herding fish. And I'm telling you, factory farming of land animals is very, painful and toxic for these land animals, but factory farming of fish is much worse, if you can imagine. I mean, I've been to these places. You, the fish, fish farms are, the, are incredibly disgusting. I mean, where you have these swimming pools uh, filled with water. I remember looking into one, and it was filled with black water. I thought, well, it's just nothing but black water. Then I realized it was packed with fish, and the fish could hardly move. They were so crammed in there, and the workers were dumping in antibiotics and all kinds of chemicals to try to keep the fish alive. Then they're pulling them out, and they're, they're skinning them alive. I mean, it's unbelievably toxic. People are eating that stuff thinking they're getting healthy omega-3s. It's nothing but violence and, and toxicity. And, and, uh, and dairy, I mean, think of dairy. Dairy, basically, we're eating, they're feeding huge amounts of fish to cows. People don't realize this, that cows eat more, actually as much or more fish than human beings do because uh, it makes them give more milk. And so uh, uh, fish concentrate in their flesh toxins uh, much more, in a much more concentrated way than, than any other way. In virtually all of the heavy metals, PCBs, uh, dioxin, nuclear radiation, it all ends up eventually in the ocean. And then these, these fish concentrate it because they're breathing the water, and they're also very often at the top of long food chains. So the large fish that we eat, like salmon and tuna and so forth, they're very, they concentrate 
enormous amounts of toxins. And then, so we eat the fish, we get all of that directly. It's, it's very, it's good. It's great for the cancer industry, right? I mean, they're guaranteed to make a lot of money. It's great for the bankers in the background that have made all the loans for all the hospitals and all the medical equipment. They're promoting this. Of course they're promoting it. The media, they're all promoting this. That's how you make your money. They haven't made any money on me in 45 years. I haven't gone, you know? <laughs> I've boycotted the whole medical industry. But the whole idea is to understand that uh, when we're eating dairy, we're eating, we're eating all that fish that, goes, that the, dairy, the cows are eating. So all the heavy metals and pieces. And it concentrates in mammary secretions more than anywhere in the body. So all the, cow, the cows are eating all kinds of other stuff, too. And so the toxins, uh, as well as the naturally occurring toxins in dairy products, there's, there's huge amounts of estrogen. And there's an estrogen that's the same exact, molecularly exactly the same estrogen as in human, that we use the estrogen in human beings. And so we heard yesterday about how, uh, for example, uh, girls start having their uh, first menstruation. I mean, in Japan, for example, right after World War II, uh, Japan lost the war. And the United States went in with the dairy industry to really bring them down, even worse. And, and had all, told all the Japanese people, now you've got to eat dairy. And so the dairy industry can make a lot of money. And so the, the Japanese started eating a lot of dairy products uh, because they were forced to by the American business. And uh, in one generation, the age of the first menstruation of girls went from about 17 to about 12 in one generation. And think what that does to, a, to, a, to society. When you have girls getting their first menstruation at the age of 12, Psychologically, we're not ready to have sex and have kids and all that. It should be, you know, 17 or, or so, and that's what it naturally would be. But dairy products, all the estrogen, destroy, and, and of course, it's the driving force behind breast cancer in women, prostate cancer, so many other problems for men. And then casein, the main protein in milk, uh, we don't have renin. Like little calves have renin, the enzyme renin, that breaks down casein. So casein causes enormous problems to us. Again, it's filling up the hospitals with type 1 diabetes and uh, all the autoimmune diseases. That's pretty much all caused by casein and, the, and our, our uh, autoimmune uh, system trying to protect from casein. So we have to understand that IGF-1 growth hormone, which is rampant in dairy, because ca a calf puts on you know, 1,000 pounds uh, in about you know, nine months, what the, you know, that's, that's like throwing gasoline on a fire. It's, a, again, the driving force behind breast prostate and many other types of cancer is dairy. So to really understand that we have this system in place that's based on herding animals, it works great for the wealthy elite that gets rich on destroying environments and on controlling uh, resources and on sick people and on wars, but for us, the 99.9% .9 of the people, why, why are we supporting that? Why don't we wake up and realize that if we enslave animals, that's the template, the mental and emotional and spiritual and cultural template that we will be enslaved the same way the cows are. You go to a hospital, the way women have to give birth to their babies, it's the same as a dairy. That's not, I own you, I own your baby. I'm going to... Yeah, I'm going to do the drugs on that baby that I want to do. I mean, we, don't, we've, we will lose complete control of, our, of ourselves because of animal agriculture. Because we, whatever we sow, we will reap. If we're going to sow violence and slavery on a massive scale, how can we expect to be free? So herderism started in Iraq about 10,000 years ago. And it was for the first time on planet Earth that animals were imprisoned for food. It was started with wild sheep, and then wild goats, and then about 2,000 years later, wild cows, and then other animals. And so it started with, with, um, with these animals, and it did about seven things. I'm gonna, I'll just quickly go through this. Uh, what it, I'll, just, I'll put them all up here at once here. Then, so basically, uh, all these things work together. Uh, these essentially animals were reduced. So animals went from being mysterious and powerful cohabitants of the earth with us to being mere uh, property. So they were, their status was massively reduced. Not only the animals that we were owning, but all the animals, because all the other animals now are seen as pests, right? They might interfere with my property, with my wealth. So we want to get rid of the wolves, get rid of the foxes, get rid of the bears, get rid of the bobcats, get rid of the prairie dogs. Right now, the, the USDA has a department called the Department of Wildlife Services that uses our taxpayer money, millions, 
hundreds of millions of dollars every year to do one thing, kill millions of animals. And if you go to their website and look at the list of animals that our government is killing at the behest of ranchers and farmers, there's no animal that's not being killed. I mean, every literally deer, uh, otters, skunks, bobcats, uh, swans, geese, eagles, starlings, any animal you can think of is targeted and killed by the thousands, by the millions. And so animal agriculture from the very beginning has been a war against nature. It's about men owning animals and owning land for their animals. And so that led over, as, over the years. It took thousands of years. This is a slow revolution. The revolution I'm talking about is the herding revolution. The herding revolution happened 10,000 years ago, and we're in that culture we're still in a herding culture. It never changed. And these, this is what happened historically. So this is, this is something that's really critical to understand. Once we started reducing animals, and then gradually, as, again, as many centuries went by, a wealthy elite class emerged. There was never a wealthy elite class until we had animal agriculture. Because gradually, a certain class of men emerged uh, who are powerful and wealthy. Why? Because they own capital. Capita is the ancient Latin word that means head. They own head of sheep and goats and cows. These are the proto-capitalists that, that began to dominate their entire society, the wealthy elite class. I used to teach college courses in these ancient texts, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Iliad, the Odyssey, the ancient Old Testament writings, the ancient Greek writings. You just read these books, and it's right there. You can read about it. There's these wealthy kings. They're dominating the political and economic and religious life of their societies, and they're powerful because they own the most livestock which were wealth, they're the foundation of wealth. The words that we have, the word pecuniary, for example, that means wealth or money, means, it comes from pecos, which means cow. So these, these animals were the foundation for wealth. And that led uh, directly to uh, this, this one here, Gavia, the desire for more cows. This is war. There had never been war on planet Earth. But as the system matured and developed, and you had more and more powerful kings with lots of livestock. Then it was the, this is, <laughs> this sound familiar? War was when the rich wanted to get richer, right? That's the foundation of war. And so that was exactly what started when a, a wealthy king with lots of capital, lots of livestock, saw another king with lots of capital. He said, I want to take that capital. I want to get that wealth. And so they would go and try to take it. Of course, the, there would be a big battle, a big war. And these wars were hideous. You don't want to read about the violence and horror of these wars. But whoever lost the war, all of the livestock became the property of the victor. Their land became the property of the victor, the water, so they could, they could double their wealth. And the people who lost the war were be, also became the property of the victor. So we had the beginning, because of animal agriculture, of owning animals, then we had slavery. And slavery is not over. There's more slavery today than there was in 1865 when we had the Emancipation Proclamation. There's more slavery now and more trafficking of humans because we're still trafficking animals. We're still slaving animals. We're still sowing the seeds of slavery. We're not going to be free of slavery if we're going to be eating enslaved animals and using products and entertainment that come from enslaved animals. So whatever we've done to animals, sooner or later we've done to each other. All of it. And we're microchipping all the animals now. You know, that, those are the seeds we're sowing. How are we going to be free if we're going to enslave animals? How are we going to live in a clean environment when you, we force animals to live in toxic environments? Go to any animal agriculture operation. It's ugly and, and toxic. They eat toxic. They eat the most toxic food. They're the most hyper-confined. They're living in their own waste. How are we not going to live in our own waste if we're forcing billions of animals to live in their own waste? How are we going to not be obese when we're forcing all these animals into obesity? That's what we're doing. And all these animals are given special drugs and hormones and feeding schedules and antibiotics and hyperconfinement and breeding for one thing, to make them obese as fast as possible. So we're sowing obesity in billions of animals, and we think we're not going to be obese. We, we can't figure it out. We're so blind as a society, we don't know the basic teaching of whatever you sow, you're going to reap. That's the basic teaching in all the world wisdom traditions, karma. Whatever you sow, you will reap. All these animals have serious diseases. They all have osteoporosis because we hyper-confine them and abuse them and steal all their milk and steal all their eggs, steal all the calcium out of their bodies, steal all the minerals out of their bodies. Their bodies are breaking, their bones are breaking under them, inside them. Chickens, cows, downer cows, they have severe osteoporosis and we get an osteoporosis epidemic. Of course, 
Cancer, they all, they all have cancer. They're eating such toxic food, they're so stressed out, and we get cancer epidemic. We break down their families, and we find our families breaking down. There's no family allowed you know, in animal agriculture. You always steal the baby from the mother. The most hideous, demonic behavior a human being is capable of, we do it on a massive scale, and then we pretend it has no consequences. How can it have no consequences? The consequences, like Martin Luther King said, we, we bomb uh, Vietnam and, they, and it explodes in our own cities. as violence and poverty and destruction. What we sow, we reap. And we are so blinded by the cultural program that we don't see it. Even the PhD intelligent people have no idea. Don't even, I mean, this is the most obvious thing. And yet, we're taught to just ignore systematically this fundamental connection. I cannot be an advocate for GMOs if I'm eating animal foods. Animal, the mentality of animal agriculture is the mentality of GMOs. It's a mentality of domination and exploitation of other beings and of ecosystems. So this is what, this is what developed uh, you know, thousands of years ago, and then we have slavery, and then the domination of the feminine. We have to understand this very clearly that the core, the animal agriculture is three things. Number one, you confine them, right? you imprison them. Number two, you kill them. But the most important thing, you can't have any of it without breeding them. It's breeding them against their will over and over again. That's the, that's the essence of animal agriculture. So it's turning the female into a mere breeder. It's reducing the sacred feminine dimension of nurturing life and bringing forth new life. There's nothing, we all know in our bones, if there's one thing we should not mess with and dominate and exploit and harm and torture and kill and destroy, it's, the, it's mothers <laughs> nursing their babies and protecting their babies and nurturing their babies. But animal agriculture, that's it. That's the original sin. This is, the, this is it. When we, when we started owning animals and eating, this is the, this, the apple is not apple in the Garden of Eden, it's meat. When we started imprisoning animals for food, this is the thing, this is the great transgression that we still have not come to terms with. And we will destroy all life on earth until we come to terms with this transgression of imprisoning animals, of impregnating them, sexually abusing them, stealing their babies and killing their babies and doing the same thing over and over again and then killing the mothers. That's the thing. So, so when men developed animal agriculture, they developed uh, a way of seeing the female as merely a breeder. So women were reduced to being mere breeders, to give me what I want. And so we have to understand, essentially, that women uh, and the domination of women and so forth is a direct result of animal agriculture. And then boys, the final thing, is we have the role model for young boys are also terribly wounded. Now the young boy has to become a hard, tough, disconnected male capable of violence against women, capable of violence against animals and rival herders. So the natural empathy and sensitivity of boys is, is shut down. And there's nothing more devastating on planet Earth than hard, tough, disconnected males. We won't survive with that kind of energy and force happening. But animal agriculture requires that. It requires, it can't function without it. So this is the system that essentially animal agriculture is and, and evolved. And this system emerged in the Eastern Mediterranean region. It spread to the Northern Mediterranean region. It spread from there into Central Asia and, 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 and into Europe and spread from Europe into North and South America, Africa. It's still spreading today through ConAgra and Cargill and Monsanto and Kentucky Fried Chicken and Dow and Burger King and, and uh, the IMF and the World Bank and the, I call it the whole thing, the military, industrial, meat, medical, pharmaceutical, media, banking complex, right? We have this complex and it's based on animal agriculture. It's based on the mentality of animal agriculture, of a few wealthy elite dominating and exploiting nature, animals, uh, and men and women in order to concentrate wealth and power in the hands of an elite. And until we wake up and understand what's happening and how important our food is, the greatest gift anyone can give the world is to move to a plant-based way of eating for ethical reasons. That's the... Thank you. That's, that's the greatest gift we can give to the world, the greatest gift we can give to our loved ones, to future generations, to hungry people, to slaughterhouse workers, to, uh, to wildlife, There's, that's, the, that's the gift. And, we, and it's a gift we give to ourselves. It's, it's escaping the prison. We can escape the prison. And um, we, there's an alternative. You can see this. You know, this is, um, 
vegan living as ahimsa. Ahimsa is an ancient Sanskrit word that means non-harmfulness. Uh, basically, living our lives as best we can to minimize the amount of harm we're causing to other expressions of life. And when we make that the foundation of our life, it, we're creating a foundation of joy and happiness and, and freedom and creativity and abundance for ourselves and for everyone. And we can all do it. We can all say, I, I, I'm doing my best to be part of the solution here rather than being part of the problem. To do the best I can to be a force for, for harmlessness, for not harming others, other expressions of life. And when we do that, we, are, we find that uh, we become much healthier on all five levels. The earth becomes healthier, our society becomes healthier, our physical health becomes much healthier, our mind and our spirit, our ethics, Everything becomes much healthier, more, more clean, more strong. Um, abundance, you can see this. V vegan living, ahimsa, or harmfulness, that L-O-W, that's local, organic, whole food, plant-based. So this is really the thing, you know, a plant-based way of eating without imprisoning animals, a whole food is very important because uh, as soon as we start using factories and making food and start using machines and start using uh, preservatives and colorings and all this stuff. So just move back to eating vegetables and grains and fruits and nuts and seeds and beans in their natural state. Uh, this is a wonderful foundation. In organic, I don't have to talk about organic is essential because as soon as we're using pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides uh, and, and other uh, chemical fertilizers, we're killing bees and birds, we're destroying fish habitat, we're, it, we're, you know, so a vegan way of living is based on, on caring and love and kindness and respect for all expressions of life, and when we have our way of eating and our way of living as best we can on that foundation, then for the few years we're on this earth, we're, we're doing the best we can to be part of the solution. And, and I would say, besides those uh, things, I mean, you could go a little farther. We have a little bit of a joke, but what we're saying is uh, an organic, whole food, plant-based, vegan, uh, fair trade, uh, non-GMO, uh, uh, glyphosate-free, mindfully prepared with non-toxic cookware with love way of eating. <laughs> that kind of says the whole thing. <laughs> and we can all... <laughs> You know, we have, to look at all, we have to look at all those aspects and do the best we can to try to fulfill that in our daily life. And it's beautiful. It actually gets better and better. The food gets more delicious. Our bodies get more healthy. The earth, the, the aquifers, the planet, I mean, everything uh, gets healthier. To understand this, to bring our lives into alignment with this, and then to share this with other people as best we can creatively with love and respect. There's no one to blame, really. I mean, everyone's wounded by this. We're all wounded. I mean, I, when I was raised in a, uh, with, I, my, we knew of super rich people, you know, and they're not happy. They're committing suicide. They have to totally perverse kind of livelihoods, many of them. So the whole idea is to heal the wounds and to awaken out of this. And so uh, in my own life, uh, this, guy, this kind of little thing kind of shows uh, nobody wants to acknowledge the cow in the room. Diabetes rates have doubled. There are dead zones in the ocean. I'm worried about the next pandemic. The rainforests are disappearing. Why is our society so violent? Global warming is unstoppable. My doctor says I need angioplasty. 800 million people are starving. California's running out of water. Animal agriculture is the cow in the room. One in single industry causing so much devastation. And we have to understand that this goes, this permeates into every dimension of uh, physically and non-physically of our lives, our shared lives together. So from now on, uh, there'll be uh, every few minutes, uh, every minute or so, paintings by my wonderful spouse, Madeline, uh, of animals, so you can, if you like, enjoy looking at the, the art. But I just want to say a couple of uh, final uh, points here that I think are essential. Like in my own journey, uh, I kind of left off there at the farm uh, in Tennessee. After that, I, so I became a vegetarian at the farm, and... Uh, I discovered, actually, many years later, it was so interesting, that was in, uh, the, toward the end of 1975, I found out years later when I met Madeline that this young Swiss uh, artist in Switzerland, that she also, the same exact month and year, uh, also decided to never eat meat in her life, too, in Switzerland. <laughs> and then a few years later, finally, we, we met each other. But in 19, um, uh, 19, let's see, it was 19... 80, I was in San Francisco at that point, and I learned a little bit more about the routine abuse of cows and, and uh, hens, so I became a vegan in 1980, and then a few years after that, I decided to become a Zen Buddhist monk, so I shaved my head, I, I was living in South Korea in a monastery called Songwangsa, and I realized, actually, that for the second time in my life, I was in a vegan community. 
Uh, and uh, it was kind of similar. They never talked about it being vegan uh, because it was, a si- it was totally silent. We didn't talk about anything. <laughs> but actually, uh, but I was there <laughs> meditating. But, but it was so neat. There was no meat. There was no dairy. There was no eggs, no wool, no silk, no leather, no fur, no, even, no killing mosquitoes or insects. The whole thing was based on ahimsa. The whole, the whole community, and they've been, living, they've been living a vegan lifestyle for almost eight, about 800 years, you know, since the 1200s or something. And so I realized that what we call veganism is not this new hippie thing from California. This is actually an ancient wisdom tradition that goes back hundreds of years, probably thousands of years. People have understood that if we are really serious about spiritual awakening, about intellectual illumination, about cultural health, uh, and harmony, about emotional stability. We can't be eating animal foods. I mean, it's the opposite. It destroys our emotional stability and, and happiness. It destroys our intellect. It destroys our, our spirituality, our societies. We become perversions, really. Eating animal foods, I mean, it's, it's obvious. It's, it becomes really obvious. There's a great saying by Krishnamurti. He said, it's not a good idea to be well-adjusted to a profoundly sick society. <laughs> and I think you know, we have to really understand that. It's not a good idea to be well-adjusted to a profoundly sick society. And yet when we leave here, we go out into the world, we see people are eating huge amounts of meat, dairy products, and eggs. And so as, as people living in society, the natural tendency we all have is we want to get along, we want to eat the same food they're eating, because food is the primary way that we, we relate to each other. It's, it's through food. This is the main way that we socialize. So if we go to, uh, for, to dinner, Thanksgiving, weddings, church, whatever it is, work, we're eating the same food. So it's very tribal. So as soon as we start questioning the food in our society, it's like we, become, we start to live in a different tribe. And people don't like us anymore. If I say I'm a vegan, a lot of people say, well, I don't like you because you're a vegan. You're not part of my tribe. You know, so it's very scary for us uh, to, to even question animal agriculture. And, it's, and also, it's the food that we were given by our own parents, right? And so you have to understand that cross, not, not just cross-culturally, but across all species, the, the number one most primary teaching across all species is, is eat this. I remember watching some ducks in Switzerland on a lake and the mother and all her little babies and she was teaching them, eat this, don't eat this, this is what you do. And so for us, when we're taught to eat a certain food by our parents, it's very difficult at a very deep level uh, to question that. So on some level, I think it's, it's a miracle that anyone actually goes vegan because we have to question our society, our parents, we have to question the doctors, we have to question everything. And yet our spirit, our, our wisdom can do it. And so the thing that's really important, I think, is to create communities of sanity. See, the, the thing is we're born into a community of insanity. Animal agriculture is insane. It's, 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 it's de- like I said, it's demonic. It's based on the most hideous violence toward the most vulnerable beings. And not just causing the violence, but eating it and feeding it to our children. Uh, it's actually, uh, I mean, I won't go into it. it, it it's really, uh, it's, so, it's so destructive uh, to us on every level. And so to understand that what we can do, and once we understand this, is the greatest gift, really, uh, in terms of being effective, I think, as advocates, to help tra- have a, the revolution that everybody's talking about, a benevolent revolution, is to create alternative communities. Create communities based on kindness and respect and on wisdom and sustainability and freedom and liberation and abundance. So that means creating plant-based communities, essentially organic plant-based communities, however we can do that. They can be like right now, we have here for 10 days, or whatever it is here at this hotel, we have uh, this type of community of, based on wisdom. We can talk about these ideas, we can eat food based on this, we can share, we can share our, our understandings with each other, and then this will radiate and ripple out into the web of relations in our society. We can, have, uh, we can create vegan restaurants, we can create uh, vegan cooking classes, and uh, sanctuaries, and uh, many different types of communities, and, and online groups, and vegan festivals, veg fests, all these different things. Vegan, organic, uh, raising awareness about the impact of our way of living on, on each other. And I think once we understand that each one of us has unique gifts and capacities that we can contribute to this, 
that we, we have, uh, maybe we're really good at, in music or art or writing or communication or organizing, whatever it is, this is the most important thing. And to question the underlying attitudes, I'm going to come back to that because I didn't have a chance to go into that, uh, and it's really important. Uh, I mentioned the attitude of, uh, with every meal we're eating, is the attitude of disconnectedness. I want to just mention like two or three more other ones. Uh, that I think kind of complete this whole thing, even though there's even a lot more I would like to say. But um, one is uh, we're eating, with every meal, if we're eating animal foods, we're eating a mentality of privilege and elitism. It's very important to understand that the subtext of every meal, if we're eating animal foods, is certain beings are inherently inferior. Other beings are inherently superior. And it's totally fine for the superior beings to dominate and exploit and abuse and oppress, however they want, the inferior beings. That's the basic message unspoken message if we're eating animal foods. And so, again, how can we ever expect to create any kind of effective movement for equality or justice or freedom if we're eating animal foods? It's absurd. It really is absurd. We're, we're wanting for ourselves what we refuse to give. Our blindness is shouting so strongly, but we don't hear it, we don't see it, because we're wounded. It's not our fault. We have to understand our basic intelligence has been shut down so much by this that we, we just don't see it. So I'm here just to remind us, basically, that we, we have to have integrity. We need to live, you know, we're called to live our lives according to what we would like to accomplish in the world. And the be, all beings who are... Um, are vulnerable to my choices, I have to, you know, I'm called to think about that, to be aware of that as best I can. So that's one. Another one uh, is commodification. Essentially, every meal is teaching us at a deep level that certain beings are not beings. Certain beings are commodities. I mean, just think about that for a minute. Certain beings are not beings. They're commodities. We buy and sell them by the pound, by their weight. We, we do that. We, we call ourselves intelligent. We buy and sell beings by the pound. Can you imagine a superior species coming here and thinking we taste good and saying, well, we're going to buy and sell you guys by the pound now. And I'd say, well, no, 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 you can't do that to me because, you know, I can play the piano. I mean, you know, so you can't sell me by the pound. I mean, I have, you know, I have all this beautiful feelings and creativity come flowing through me. They say, well, I don't care about that. We're going to eat you. We don't care about any of that. You're just a piece of meat to us. We would think these are incredibly stupid, blind, idiotic, superior species. Right? That's us. Incre I mean, just off the charts, stupid. We can't see that be these are beings. You look into their eyes, it's so obvious. There's someone in there. That they have feelings, they have personalities, they are unique. And go to any animal sanctuary and, and rub the, the a pig's belly or, or, or hang out with some chickens or turkeys, they're all unique beings, and they have their own relations, and they have their yearnings. So the whole thing to understand is that we are, we're all harmed by this, and what this does is it creates materialism and reductionism. We have, as I talk about in the World Peace Diet, we have materialist science, reductionist science, materialist religion, reductionist religion. Our, 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 our two primary modes of knowing uh, you know, these institutions, I should say, institutions of science, the institution of, of religion, institution of education also, they're all so, they're just um, uh, perversions uh, of true knowledge. We reduce everything to matter, and, and we, we think if we can't measure it, it doesn't exist. And so our knowledge, uh, our technology that comes from science, what is it doing? It's destroying us. GMOs, 5G, massive nuclear bombs. This is what we have our smartest people working on. Our great, they get the most money. If they can make the most destructive things, the things that imprison us so we can never escape. Monitoring systems so we are all become little cows in the big pasture that they're controlling. You know, technology will do that. These, these animals, they have no chance. Our technology is so powerful. They have no chance. Well, that, that's, our, that's our science. That's materialist science with materialist religion that reduces religion in the same way to a, a dogmatic, enigmatic male deity looking down and, and judging us and so forth. This is all a projection of animal agriculture, education that just dumbs down children so that they will be cogs in a machine. That's animal agriculture education. We do plant agriculture the way we do animal agriculture. This is, we have to understand this very clearly. There's two kinds of agriculture. 
right? There's plant agriculture and animal agriculture. If someone says they're a farmer, you have to say, what kind, <laughs> plant or animal? Going back, plant agriculture was always women's work primarily because it's working with the forces of nature and the beautiful abundance of nature. You plant one seed and you get trees that give us thousands of, of fruits and seeds. The apple tree doesn't charge us by the apple. Right? They just come. It's just abundance. And so there's always been this, uh, these, these feasts of, of gratitude for the earth and the abundance of the earth. And we're working with the cycles of, of nature, of the moon and the seasons. We're working uh, with the natural abundance of life. We, don't make, we, plant, a, we plant a seed and the, the, the vegetables and the fruits and the berries and, and so forth, they grow and we can eat them. This is a, a cause for enormous joy and we can eat whatever we want. We can, we can grow it that way, we can eat it. So we're working with, in harmony with nature, essentially and a sense of abundance and joy. But animal agriculture from the very beginning was always men's work. Women were not really doing that at all. And it was always the opposite, the exact opposite. The animals wanted to be free. They did not want to have their babies stolen and their lives stolen and their milk stolen and their eggs stolen and their purposes stolen. If we steal their purposes, we lose our own purpose. We have to understand that. We, have no, we don't have our purpose. But animal agriculture is based on stealing the purposes and lives of other living beings on a massive scale, and who are resisting. You don't want to have it happen, so it's violent. We just use violence. And so now, since we live in a society, we're born into a society based on animal agriculture, we do plant agriculture the way we do animal agriculture. We use GMOs. We use uh, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, monocropping, cutting down everything and growing just a few things, killing everything else. That's all animal agriculture. So again, in order to get to the roots of the GMO problem, all these other problems, we have to move to a plant-based way of eating. We have to go, I'll say the word, you know, go vegan. Um, I love the word vegan because it's actually a word that means something, but, um, but the problem with the word vegan is that um, it's, it's a category, right? I'm a vegan, you're not a vegan. And the whole problem with animal agriculture is it creates these categories of separation. That's a cow, a pig, chicken, that's a food animal. So in many ways, what we're talking about really is healing ourselves from categories and a mentality of radical inclusion that includes all living beings in the sphere of our kindness and compassion. And so I think to just understand that moving to a plant-based way of eating or moving to a vegan way of living is a, a word for basically just coming home to our true nature. It's nothing to be proud of. It's just simply looking with eyes that when we see beings, we see beings rather than seeing objects to be used. And that is liberating for us and for, for everyone. And then the final, I'm, I know I'm just about out of time here. The final uh, attitude that, we, that animal agriculture really requires is the domination of the sacred feminine. I mentioned earlier, this is, I talk about in the World Peace Diet as Sophia. And Sophia is the ancient Greek word that means a wisdom. So this is the wisdom that lives in all of us, whether we're uh, men or women, we have this inner wisdom that yearns to love and nur nurture and protect life. And that inner wisdom is sacred and precious, and yet animal agriculture is based at its core on repressing Sophia, repressing that natural wisdom within us as human beings so that we can eat the flesh and secretions of horribly abused animals so that we can steal the babies and kill the babies and so forth. So it's based on destroying family structures, destroying the mother and child bond. Animal agriculture is based on destroying Sophia, that natural wisdom in us. So not only does it cause tremendous suffering to the female animals and to the, to the babies, uh, as we rape and kill them, but, it's all, but it hurts us too. It's, it, it shuts down Sophia in us. So what we're talking about with, with veganism, essentially, is the resurrection of Sophia, the resurrection of the sacred feminine dimension of life that yearns to love and nurture and protect life. And that lives in all of us, whether we're men or women, to, to live our lives as best we can as expressions of infinite internal consciousness. So I'm just gonna close with that idea that each one of us is a manifestation of the love that is the source of all life on this beautiful planet. Each one of us is a field of eternal consciousness. I really recommend if you have a practice of meditation to quiet your mind every day and just learn to listen within and realize that beyond the clouds of our conditioning 
of being raised in the wounds of being raised in a hurting culture, there's an infinite sky of consciousness that is liberated and free and is of the nature of compassion and kindness and joy and creativity and liberation. And we can tap into that at every moment and we can create a movement that's maturing so that we see all beings as wounded, as, you know, other human beings as wounded, so we can be the healers to bring this message in a loving and kind way and help create societies and communities of sanity and freedom and liberation and transform our society. And I have to say, traveling all over the world, like I've been doing for the last you know, 20 or five years or so with the World Peace Diet, is that it, the, the momentum is really building very quickly and there is a very positive transformation happening and we're part of that. So we can wake up every morning and just give thanks knowing that we have another day to contribute to the healing of our world, to learn more, to care more, to contribute, to make connections and to help make this movement grow and prosper for this really short time we're on this planet. We're just here for a few short decades. So to come here to this planet that's being so wounded and mugged really by animal agriculture and bring an alternative based on sanity and healing, I think is the greatest gift we can give to the world. So I want to thank all of you because I know if you're here, whether you're here physically or by live stream, um, you're part of this awakening, you're part of the healing, you're part of the pioneering effort that's being made to, to really awaken out of the delusion of violence that is animal agriculture. And when we, be, when we put our energy into this together and cooperate, we are transforming our planet and no effort is ever lost. So thank you all very much. Please go forth and multiply the message as best you can. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Much love. Much love to all of you. It, it all helps. Everything helps. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I wish I had more time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>